spirits don't speak English or French or Mandarin or sign language. They speak frequency. And what a spirit does, uh, um, their collective or their electromagnetic soul is emitting a wave of frequency, an electromagnetic impulse. That electromagnetic impulse interfaces with my brain's electromagnetic field, and then that wave gets converted into recognizable concepts based on my memories, feelings, or cultural association. Welcome back to another edition here on Mentory TV. From Crisis to Creation is a series that I've launched at the beginning of the first lockdown in April 2020. Now, we are almost at the end of 2021. I can tell you one thing. The COVID virus is not only still around, but is mutating. And right now, and I can actually make it a date, we do have Omicron around. So things are certainly not letting off. That means also we not only are being confronted, continue to be confronted with a pandemic, but with a lot of death and sorrow as well. Now, I have to say, one thing is, of course, the pandemic, which is tragic, but I also lost my mom only about a couple of months ago. So it all kind of fits into something that you may even call serendipity because I got this book into my hands. It's called The Afterlife Frequency, The Scientific Proof of Spiritual Contact and How That Awareness Will Change Your Life by Mark Anthony J.D. Mark. Thank you so much for joining us here on Mentory TV. It's awesome to speak to you about something that is like so pertinent, so actual and very personal in my case. Vielen Dank, or thank you very much. It's an honor uh, to be here, Patricia. Um, I've really been looking forward to, to speaking with you as well. Well, Mark, you know, before we get into what you try to express in your book and really try to communicate to the general public. Let's talk a little bit about you as the originator, talking about life, death, the afterlife. How come um, you are known as, um, you know, a medium, somebody that can actually bridge and communicate between who we are here in the living, in the material world and the beyond or the afterlife? Well, uh, this has been part of my DNA, literally, from, from day one. I was about three and a half years old, and I started seeing spirits. And And it's not unusual, Patricia, for a toddler to talk to and have invisible friends. But when my mother and father can see them as well, and they knew what was happening, because both of my parents had these abilities. And my mother was a commercial illustrator, an artist, fashion designer, and she was of Italian descent. And her side of the family, and there's mediums that run in it uh, for generations, she was like, oh, my gosh, she's got it. And my father, who was a Navy SEAL and at the time a NASA engineer, was like, oh, he's got it. And, <laughs> okay. All right. Well, the, the thing is. My father was very concerned about my abilities, not because he saw it as a negative thing, but it would be how people treated me. And then when I was about five years old, um, I was beginning school. I was starting Catholic school. I was raised in the Catholic faith. And I remember before I went to school, my father, he you know, got down um, on, on a knee and he looked me right in the eye and he says, Mark. Do not talk to this about anyone but your mother and I. He said, you can tell us anything you want, but other people won't understand. And people who see things that others don't will get taken away. Well, Patricia, that really scared me. And he, and he wasn't trying to scare me. He was trying to protect me. Mm -hmm. And there was always this, you know, don't talk about it. Don't talk about it. And I, I certainly, when I, when I started school, you know, I figured, oh, you know, we're in Catholic school and they're talking about angels and saints and all these invisible entities. And then the dogma came in and I realized, okay, don't, don't do this. But I discovered years later why my dad was so fearful for me. About 20 years before I was born, his sister Marjorie was also a medium. He had three sisters, one who died uh, when she was 20, 
And he was the closest to her, and that really devastated my father. And then he was closest to Marjorie. And Marjorie, my dad, his mother, Grace, and um, excuse me, his mother, Isabel, and the maternal grandmother, Grace, were all mediums. And it goes back even farther than that. But Marjorie got married to this very religious fundamentalist, um, and he was afraid of her abilities. And so, and she was very good at premonitions. She would pick up on, on things that would happen. And he was a machinist. He worked at a steel factory, steel plant in, uh, I believe it was in Harrison, Pennsylvania. And so one morning he's getting ready to go to work and Marjorie throws a fit. She goes, you're not going, you're not going. Something horrible is going to happen. And he got, they got into this big argument. He goes, fine, fine, I'll stay home. Well, that day, Patricia, a crane was lifting thousands of pounds of steel beams and the, the cable snapped and it crushed the machine shop that he worked in. It killed everybody there. Amazing. So logically, you know, if he had been there, he would have been killed. Well, you might think that he would have been grateful, but this yeah. intensified his fear of her. And he conspired with a psychiatrist who diagnosed her as a paranoid schizophrenic they sent uh, these men in, a, in an ambulance to her home, forcibly removed her, put her in a straitjacket. They took her to a mental institution, and poor Marjorie was subjected to electroshock therapy for over six months. Mm -hmm. And it so damaged her brain that she never spoke about seeing spirits again. And, you know, my parents uh, were well aware of this. My mother would have nothing to do with, with that man. She didn't want him in her house again. And I never met my Aunt Marjorie. She died uh, before I, I, um, I was ever able to meet her. Yet she comes to me. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, in the afterlife frequency, I mention I mentioned Marjorie. Um, and I know that when she comes around, it's usually, it, it, it's a warning. It's not that she's bringing evil, but she's like, Mark, you know, you have to be alert. And so now I understand why my parents were, or especially my dad was so concerned. And at least these days, I can be on a show like this, uh, you know, shows like this. I've been on, on uh, national television, national radio, and this is a more openly discussed topic. I mean, there's still a lot of people that don't believe it and probably never will. And there are still parts of the world where what I do is punishable by death. Mm -hmm. So, so we have a long way to go, but we've come a long way as well. Yes, absolutely. And I think that your dad wanted to protect you is a good thing, considering you had both mom and dad being a medium. So I wonder how much it actually amplified within you. And, you know, the things that have been done in the name of religion, dot, 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 and that already gives it away. I'm not religious, but extremely spiritual. Yes. So uh, I was especially intrigued. And now we start talking about a little bit more detail, what you're writing is the scientific proof that there is more to us you and me and everybody, then we can actually see, feel, hear, smell with our five senses, much more. And that much more, so many people just deny simply because they can't capture and cannot allow what they cannot capture that can be potentially true. Tell us about the angle you take in your book to really prove that there is more to death than most people think. Well, People tend to only believe what they can perceive with their five physical senses of sight, hearing, taste, smell, and touch, except religious people who believe in, in, uh, in God, which I do, okay, and I, I, I'm like you. I'm, I'm very spiritual. I study religions because I believe that religions were founded by people who were studying the infinite, studying this connection with the divine power, and it's naive of us to think that our five physical senses are it. I mean, what, what were the stars before the invention of the, the telescope? People had all these bizarre theories that it was holes in the fabric of heaven, that they were angels, that, that all types of things. And then let's go to the subatomic. What, what was the cause of disease before the invention of the microscope? And I'm glad that you started the show talking about COVID. This is a very real thing. This isn't anything made up. It's not a hoax because human history has been plagued by plagues. And 
you know, people thought that noxious vapors would cause them that evil spirits. You know, when you look at um, uh, read literature from the 19th century and uh, what was that movie? Gone with the Wind. Mm -hmm. And he saw the Southern Bells. They were fanning themselves, talking about the vapors, the vapors. Well, what they're talking about was they believe that vapors at night, um, these these noxious gases would make people sick. Well, then with the advent of the microscope, they began to see germs, bacteria, fungus, uh, eventually viruses. And so we know from science that there is so much more to our existence than what we can perceive through the five physical senses. I mean, NASA has theorized that dark matter in other words, what we're not able to perceive composes over 90% of the universe. So look at it like this. Yep. Hard science is saying we're only capable of perceiving 10% of reality. Now, when it comes to the, the afterlife, I've spent my entire life uh, studying this, and so have many people for thousands of years. And we have accounts of near-death experiences, which were chronicled as far back as, I believe, Hippocrates and Plato in ancient Greece. But that's not the only place where they were mentioned, where people died. And then they came back to life and they began talking about this transcendent realm, going through a light, encountering deceased loved ones, encountering this vast intelligence. And what was fascinating about this, uh, Patricia, is more often than not, in fact, almost all of the time, what they came back explaining was not in conjunction with their religious beliefs. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, uh, Plato, in his Republic, wrote about this soldier by the name of Ur, and Ur was killed in battle, and according to Greek custom, they put him on a funeral pyre, and they're just beginning to light it, and all of a sudden he comes back to life, and he talks about going into a light, encountering deceased loved ones, encountering this infinite intelligence, and, and he talked about several lifetimes and how we're all connected. Yeah. Did he see Zeus? No. Did he see Aphrodite or Ares or any of the Greek gods? No. He saw something greater than that. And he spoke about reincarnation, which was not part of the ancient Greco-Roman belief system. Mm -hmm. and, and anyway, I'm just using that as an example because there's several of them throughout history. So within the last 50 years, we've had survival of consciousness and near-death experience research, which has concluded that the who and what we are survives physical death. And, and if you indulge me just for um, another minute, that's why I introduce in the afterlife frequency new terminology to define these phenomena. Um, as a medium, mediumship and the terminology related to it was coined in the Victorian era, mm -hmm. and it's antiquated and out of date. And I developed the term, the electromagnetic soul. And I knew that you were going to ask that one. <laughs> <laughs> we are answering all my 500,000 questions, which is only half of what I really have. <laughs> yes. Well, I came up with the term, the electromagnetic soul after years of research, because every great teacher, every great uh, faith leader, going back to the sages of ancient India, to Zoroaster, Moses, Buddha, Jesus, Confucius, Muhammad, Lao Tzu, Native American spiritualist, Gandhi, Mother Teresa. I mean, you could go globally. They all talk about the soul, who and what we are, pre-existing the body, coming into the body, and then moving on when the body dies. And we know from the laws of physics that energy is neither created nor destroyed, only transferred from one form to another. We know from neuroscience, the field that studies the human brain, that the brain has an electrical field. The whole body does. And, uh, but the brain has the most complex electrical field. And that everything on the subatomic level is composed of electromagnetic energy. So in a nutshell, I developed the term electromagnetic soul to define what we really are, which is 
a pure spirit consciousness, which is eternal electromagnetic energy, neither created nor destroyed, only transferred from one form to another. Yes. And just to kind of uh, unfold this a little bit more. In physics, you write in your book, actually, if you look at quantum physics, there is no such thing as matter. Because as you were going, as you were saying, so you have the atom, then you have the proton, the electron, the neutron, and under that, you have the quanta. So quantum physics, which I studied also thanks to Joe Dispenza, uh, is, you know, you create, you can see what you want to see, or you can blind out or blink out what you don't want to see. It depends very much uh, on that. So even us in that physical form right now living, is actually nothing else but energy, frequency at a different level, which either like water is more condensed or when it evaporates, it's still water, but in a different form. Exactly. Exactly. I I love that analogy. Yeah, we could look at our world as a chunk of ice. Okay. Or rather, let's look at, at inanimate objects like this pen. Okay. Because I love what you said about, all right, everything's made of molecules which in turn are made of atoms, which in turn are composed of electrons, protons, and neutrons. All right, we all studied that in school. And then with the advent of quantum physics, like you correctly pointed out, those particles are made of a smaller, the smallest particle, which is a quantum. Now for the physicists and the science people who are listening, technically an electron is a quantum because it's one eighteen hundredth the size of a proton. So let's make sure we, you know, we, we, we you know, cause I know Get people write it right. scientifically. Oh, blah, 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 blah. Like, look, yeah, we know that. All right. <laughs> <laughs> there, I mean, uh, Patricia and I could spend all day just explaining what I explained, but what that means is that everything, Thing is electromagnetic energy. And this pen is the same electromagnetic energy that I am, that Patricia is, that you are, that the radio waves that are broadcasting the show, that the light you see, that the uh, water in the ocean, the surface of the moon, the distance between the stars, everything's electromagnetic energy. And we also know from quantum physics that everything has a vibration, which is why think of, of inanimate objects as a chunk of ice, it's water. Think of us as liquid water, okay, because we've got more vibration, more movement, and think of spirits as steam, mm-hmm. okay? So I loved your analogy, um, and and when we begin to understand that, we realize that what people that are having a near-death experience are talking about, that we're all interconnected, because we are energetically on the subatomic level, everything is electromagnetic energy. And once again, the electromagnetic soul, when we die, think of our brain as a drop of water. And that drop of water leaves our brain and plunges into the eternal sea, what I call the collective consciousness. And that's why when spirits come through and they'll communicate um, to somebody, they can give you information that far exceeds anything that they knew. And oftentimes they'll bring through messages of a healing nature, because that's what spirit communication is all about. It's about love, healing, resolution, and peace. Yes. And that is something that was really an eye opening, uh, eye opener for me, um, Mark. And that was when a, a couple you described lost their baby. And all of a sudden, they the, the, the spirit of the baby came to you and talked to you about something that was extremely mature. And they said, well, how can our baby know that? And that is another reason uh, to, to just explain that a soul is ancient. It was there before. It goes into the body and it will be after the body diseases still there. And in that collective consciousness can absorb whatever the wisdom there is and can transpire it, which was which which I thought was very interesting. Now, in terms of the vibration, I find this super interesting with regards to what you have as a gift, as a medium. All right. Now, in your in your book, without giving too much away, you describe what we all have. Okay, these premonitions. Somehow, right. something doesn't feel right. Um, we can't put it into words. We can't even visualize. But we get kind of like, ooh, I just don't like it. I remember when we bought this house where we are. I walked in and went like, whoa, 
Okay. <laughs> it has been a, a house. It's a bit like an Adams family house. All right. <laughs> has been derelict for about five years. And my husband went in and went like, whoa, I love it. You know, and he's like a total alpha animal. And I'm quite feminine. I'm like, oh, this is, a, you know, very dungeon like literally so I had also a spiritual cleaner coming in and she confirmed what I couldn't put into words that this was a quite a well let's put it this way besieged house but definitely totally male dominant house and it needed to be equalized but coming back to the frequency and and you're I don't know whether it's talent gift or just the way of how you work as a as a person or as a soul it's the interpretation of frequency, because this is what I find so interesting. You talk about AM and FM, like in yeah. the radio, okay? So you and I are low frequency in our human bodies. We're in AM radio, yes. Yeah, AM radio. And FM going, do, 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 is the soul. Right. Now, apparently, there are two parts of our body that you can read. Yeah, that's the pineal gland or our third eye also Very and good. the solar plexus right right and once i feel something somewhere <laughs> you know exactly how to interpret it now tell us about what especially the pineal gland can do and which is also our access the joe blogs access to the raft mess uh, method that you describe also yes we have two um Everybody that that uh, studies yoga or um, spirituality knows about the seven chakras in our body. And I know the science people are probably rolling their eyes going, oh, God, here we go with the hippie stuff. However, the seven chakras also their location coincides with the seven endocrine glands in our body. And the endocrine glands operate on electrical and chemical impulses and the two receptor areas in our body. Uh, the, the, is the solar plexus, which is at the the base of the uh, of the chest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, uh, yeah, the diaphragm okay. right near the uh, the pancreas, and and talk to any first responder, talk to anybody in the military. Gut instinct. Okay, now this is where where you know because um, women's intuition is a given. All right, all the women I know have women's intuition, and they'll feel something there. Well. Guys will dismiss that until you talk about gut instinct, because that's much more, you know, Harrison Ford, Samuel L. Jackson, Chris Pratt, gut instinct. Hoorah! Okay. <laughs> and it's a real thing because the solar plexus is the second most complex bundle of nerves outside of the cerebral cortex in your brain. And this is the where- The second we brain. Hmm? The second brain. In fact, it's even been called that by, by a number of, of uh, uh, doctors and biologists. And, uh, you know, other animals have brains. An octopus has five brains. I mean, hey, uh, so so that's why, let's say you're you're a parent and you feel something bad happened to your child and you feel it in your stomach. Yeah. Or people say, I feel it in my gut. This is not some fluke or coincidence. This is you're picking up on vibration. And for people who are mediums, who are psychics, when we um, when I connect with a spirit, one of the first things they give me is uh, physical symptoms associated with their passing. And I feel it. OK, so that's this receptor area. Then the pineal gland in our brain is the most unusual and most studied and most unknown gland in our body. It's about four to five inches behind the center of the forehead, the proverbial third eye chakra. It has calcite and magnetite crystals in it, according to um, a British and German study. And then the Fren and French Israeli study also confirmed this. And calcite and magnetite, when placed under stress, generate electromagnetic impulses. The pineal gland governs our perception of light. And I think it's not just the physical perception of light. And by the way, light is the only form of electromagnetic energy visible to the human eye. Also, it's how we perceive the spiritual energy of God. People talk about I'm enlightened. Mm -hmm. and, and so the pineal gland also regulates our brainwave frequency. And we have five brainwave frequencies, gamma, beta, alpha, theta, delta. The gamma is ultra high functioning. And I think when like, we study, when we concentrate. Concentrate, you're on final jeopardy, you know? Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> the common knowledge, whatever frequency is just missing when it comes yeah, to Yeah, that's me. Ken Jennings whatever. and Adam Modio going off the screen. Right? <laughs> and then uh, most of the time when we're conscious, we're in the beta state. That's you know what we're in right now. That's your function. I can drive a car, use a phone, do my job. And then when you begin to relax, either as you're drifting off to sleep, you're daydreaming, or you're meditating, that's alpha. And then you go into theta, which is deep sleep and dreamful sleep. Delta is very important. There's not a whole lot of brainwave activity, but that's when you rebuild your body. It cells fight infections. All right. Alpha theta border between the groovy baby relaxed state and uh, the dreamful sleep. This is where psychic and mediumistic activity occur. This is regulated by the pineal gland. And that's why when this happens, spirits are able to spot this. And that's also why people tend to believe the contact they have with spirits when they're asleep. It's in the dream state. And, and you know, people will say, I had a dream and my, my Aunt Sarah came and talked to me and I knew it was her. Now, if they were standing at work next to the water cooler and go, hey, you know, Aunt Sarah just apply, uh, appeared to me, people look at them like they're crazy. Uh -huh. People tend to believe this more in, in the dream state. I mean, look at scripture. The Bible is loaded with people who receive contact from spirits, angelic entities in the dream state. I mean, we're talking, you know, Joseph interpreting dreams of Pharaoh, Jacob's ladder, the three wise men getting the warning about Herod being a nutcase, and Joseph, um, you know, of, of Mary and Jesus um, being warned to get Jesus and Mary out of out of Judea before Herod has them has them murdered, and uh, you know, and and, it, and so on and so forth. So the pineal gland, very unusual. It controls so many things, and it's only about uh, not quite the size of a lima bean, bigger than a grain of rice. But what was the first radio? A piece of quartz crystal with copper wire running low levels of electricity through it. We have a much more sophisticated version of that in our head. And that's why the pineal gland governs our, uh, when we connect with spirits, visual imagery, auditory imagery, and data. So you see things, hear things, know things, and the solar plexus governs the feeling things. And when you begin to work with with spirit communication you start to see that you know your body is an integrated system and the two work in conjunction and communicate but not everybody can do this and this is where people like you come into the picture because the pineal gland can do both it can emit energy and can perceive energy and the energy that Uh, you perceive, you can put into words, you can put into visions, and you can communicate them. Now, that I think is really, really the, the most important thing I think I took away from why also blind people have the same sort of experience when yeah. they are in the near-death experience, because there is this moment where you go from AM to FM, Yeah, right. uh, and vice versa. So you kind of transfer for a moment and then you're back again. And then these commonalities with we're going to the lights, we are floating, we are seeing other diseased ones, as you were just mentioning, and then looking back or looking in front or being scared. I mean, there's also the distressed kind of near-death experience or the one that you share, which I thought was, again, very, very interesting that you know, people close to you can have the same sort of feeling, vision, or whatever you experience in the near-death experience with you. Now, for, for me, as I said, that was, that was a real eye-opener that you as a medium can really put it into words what you feel. Now, what actually, you talked about reincarnation, intrigued me is the following. And I wonder what you say, and I'm not a skeptic, but you say to skeptics, we are increasingly more people, human bodies on the planet. So moving slowly, eight and a half billion, nine billion. Now you know what's coming. I okay. do. <laughs> energy, energy is always there. It just goes in, stays, goes out again, but in totally, it's in totality, it's there. So what happens? Do spirits split? when they reincarnate into two different bodies because there are two different bodies now to fill before <laughs> before it was just one but now our you know demographics are changing talk to us through this how how can we imagine that excellent question and i get this a lot um there are more people alive today on planet earth 
than have existed in all of history. So in other words, if you say that there's reincarnation, we have more bodies than we have souls. Now, what you were mentioning was the split soul theory. Um, that's not something I subscribe to. There are people that do. Um, but we are multidimensional, which means that even though I'm in this body, my electromagnetic soul is tethered to the, the afterlife frequency and having another experience in addition to this one. But we also have to realize energy neither created nor destroyed, only transferred from one form to another. So let's say that this is planet Earth. Okay, I don't have an earth nearby, so you're going to have to, it's mm -hmm. a, um, a tile of uh, ancient Greeks. <laughs> okay. okay. That right, will do. This is earth. Yeah, there we go. Okay. Um, earth is not a closed system. So there is a constant flow of energy coming into it. Souls are constantly coming in and accumulating here and eventually leaving. Because in my, my communication with spirits, and, and, and you know, I have to be careful, too, to make a statement like this, because I, at this point, can't, can't verify it. But I've asked them is, okay, so... You know, the point of reincarnation is to get to the level where you don't have to come back here. And I got this. Yes. Well, what happens then? Do we get to hang out with God? They say you transfer to another dimension. And I'm like, what? Well, when does that stop? And I got the distinct impression, Patricia, they're kind of laughing at me. Mm -hmm. And the response was, why do you worry of such things? You're there for the reasons that you're there and you need to focus on why you're there and what you're learning. When you come here, then you can be concerned with that. But to answer my question, they said that, yes, we get to a point where we no longer have to reincarnate on planet Earth, but then we transfer either to another planet, to another dimension. And they said that's energy. It's the eternal flow of energy. I go, well, when do we get to be with God? They said, you always are. And, you know, and, I, and let me tell you, that was a real head scratcher. I'm sitting yeah. there like, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and but but then again, getting back to physics, that does make sense. You know, I guess having been raised Catholic, you know, and, and a Christian, I, I want the Michelangelo painting. You know, I want to like go there and hang out with Jesus and Mary and the saints and drink red wine and and all that. And, you know, I'm, I'm thinking Sistine Chapel. Why? Because those are the perceptions that we've been given over the centuries. I mean, people's perceptions of the afterlife and in, in, um, have have been colored um, by by culture. You know, in ancient Greece, you know, it was going to the Elysium Fields, mm -hmm. which is wonderful. But if you weren't so good, you went to the underworld, to Hades, and there are all sorts of punishments and things there. The Egyptians um, had a very interesting view of the afterlife that it was basically just like this one. So the, the rich people still got to be rich, and the people that were plowing the fields along the Nile River will still be doing that. Um, that didn't sound so much fun. But but you, you go through all of these. Uh, the Vikings, uh, the Nordic people had, I think, the most interesting. The warriors got to go to Valhalla yes. and you know get to be warriors. And the bad people, well, they went to the goddess Hell, who was the goddess of the underworld. And that's where the dishonored go. And, and so there's been all these different views on this. But when we're working with the afterlife, it's so much greater than any religion, any human construct. And I'm not downing religions. Religions are a way of, it's a filter. It's a way of interpreting the infinite. It's a lot easier to relate to God in the form, if you're Hindu, of Shiva or Vishnu or Krishna, if you're Christian in the form of Jesus, mm -hmm. if you're Japanese, you know, in the form of Amarasu, um, and, and even though Buddhists don't technically believe Buddha is God, they believe he's a, like a supernatural teacher, then it is to, I'm dealing with an infinite electromagnetic energy that has no limits, bounds, and infinite intelligence, and, and so religions are a way of interpreting the infinite. And that's why I don't insult 
or denigrate religions because they serve a valuable purpose. There was something that uh, Pope John Paul II once said Mm -hmm. that I, I really liked. I didn't agree with a lot of the things that he said, but this one I did. He said, what people need to do is follow the teachings of their religions. Not the religion. Not the religion, the teachings. Peace, love, understanding. Mm -hmm. You know, Jesus never said, you need an AR-7 and go fight and kill. Buddha never said, go slaughter your enemies. That's actually the Holy Trinity. That's actually the Holy Trinity. Exactly. Yeah. No, and it's, uh, it's, uh, you quoted Rumi in your book as well, uh, where he said, you know, um, the lamps may change, but the light is always the same. Exactly. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, 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 absolutely. And I thought that hit it home very, very much. And I, I just wonder, for example, just sticking with this reincarnation uh, theme, because my mom's uh, deceased, as I said, about a couple of months ago. And and you wonder about death all of a sudden very differently. Yeah? And uh and through your book, uh, and also how you described the myth of hell, I thought that was very interesting as well, that hell or the myth of hell is actually a tool to keep us in line a little bit. Yeah, <laughs> Like also the Ten Commandments, just to keep the social structure going. But um, I, I just wonder, you know, whether hell is what we're experiencing right now because we are conscious or whether, you know, once we are in the spirit only form, you know, because the physical has then also... Uh, right. migrated whether that is really heaven and 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 you also point out in your book that energy or spirits or consciousness or whatever you want to call it they don't suffer they don't feel uh, pain they you know they are just there yes how, how can they then communicate well when i say they're there they're they're not stagnant okay um, and spirits are pure energy. They don't get sick. They don't get old. They don't get tired. They don't die. And when a spirit comes through to me, initially I get their gender. Then I may get, usually I get how they died, but what they, those are, those are identifiers because if they come through like basking in the light, like if your grandmother uh, came through and you only knew your grandmother as an older woman and she comes in looking like she did when she was 22 years old, you'd be like, who? Who are you? Yeah. You know, and that's why when when a baby comes through, normally I'll see a baby as a a star, like uh, this beautiful white light, and then I know, oh, that's a baby, because even though um, this person may have died in infancy, their soul, is, their electromagnetic soul, is an immortal living being. So if they showed up looking thirty two years old and a college professor, you'd be like. Now, who are you? So they know to work with us to give us identifiers so that we can relate to them. And then once we get confirmations on on who this is, that's when they're going to start transmitting more information to us. And uh, I was doing a reading for this gentleman and his brother came through and I said, I see him and he's he's on these crutches and he's having a hard time walking. But now he stood up and he threw the crutches aside and he started dancing. And this gentleman said, my brother had cerebral palsy and he couldn't walk. Mm. So what did his brother show him? First, the identifier that that I'm your brother. I had cerebral palsy. But now as a spirit, I'm free of this. And it was beautiful. And and this gentleman, he was in his in his 80s. And I could see the tears in his eyes because my poor brother, he struggled so hard and to see how happy he is now. And, and, you know, that's just one example of of many how spirits will let us know that they're immortal living beings. Now, why do they communicate? They love us. Mm -hmm. It's all about love. Because being electromagnetic energy, they move Everything in the electromagnetic spectrum moves at the speed of light. All right. And we earlier when you said how you know we're AM radio and the other side's FM radio, well, that's because they're the other side dimension, the afterlife frequency coincides with this one, just the way AM radio and FM radio and XM and gamma rays and ultraviolet and, and infrared and white light all coincide. That's why they can um, appear so quickly because they're just adjusting their frequency from the afterlife frequency to our material world frequency. They also are able to feel that our, our pain. 
um, think of everyone that you know on this in this world and in the afterlife as being connected to you through a three dimensional spider web. Mm-hmm. It's how do spider webs work? Through vibration. Absolutely. Something hits a spider web, it sends a vibration, the spider knows. Yep. So we're not putting a spider in this example. <laughs> okay. No. So you're grieving intensely. You're sending that vibration. The spirit picks up on it. He or she comes to you and it's like, wow, I- I'm smelling my mother's perfume. She mm-hmm. wore Chanel number no. five, but there's no bottle of Chanel number no. five anywhere. Guess what? She sent a vibration to you and it accessed a memory in your brain, one that you associated with her. Mm -hmm. Now, this I call these frequency beacons and spirits can send them to you. You can send them to a spirit. This also gets back to what we were talking about earlier with the solar plexus. Let's say you feel something's happening with your child. Well, guess what? That's a frequency beacon, too. So it, it, it seems to be more readily apparent with spirits, reason being is they're not burdened by the lower, denser vibration of a physical body. And they're okay. not blocked by the physicality and the mind and the, you know, the kind of, it's not rational. Precisely. Mm-hmm. Genau. Isn't that? Genau, that- ganz genau. Hey, your German is fabulous. <laughs> Finde ich super. I, 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 <laughs> Okay. Um, I, I spent a fair amount of time in German. I speak Tarzan German, you know, I mean, I can, <laughs> That's very they'll, look, they'll look at me and laugh, but then they'll bring me what I ordered, you know, so, so at least I'm getting the, yeah, it's like, <laughs> bought food now, I'm going. <laughs> that always works in Germany. <laughs> um, Sorry. And it's funny too, because some of my German friends would correct my pronunciation. It's one time I was, well, I'm sorry, I'm digressing, but this That's has fine. to do with spirit communication. I was in Paris and I was in my hotel room and the TV was on and I'm, I'm, and I'm seeing football and I'm hearing the announcer going, football, the American, c'est bon. And I'm like, He's speaking French with a Brooklyn accent. And then I go, oh, my God, that's how they imitate America. You know how we go, come to the French restaurant. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, and so they imitate us by affecting a Brooklyn accent. And I remember sitting down laughing. Uh, It was one of the funniest things I've ever heard. Because people were um, constantly asking me, well, you know, you always say you're seeing this feelings. Why don't they just tell you? Well, they are just telling me. Mm-hmm. Spirits don't speak English or French or Mandarin or sign language. They speak frequency. And what a spirit does, uh, um, their collective or their electromagnetic soul is emitting a wave of frequency, an electromagnetic impulse. That electromagnetic impulse interfaces with my brain's electromagnetic field. And then that wave gets converted into recognizable concepts based on my memories, feelings, or cultural associations. But I don't always understand what it is. And this is a brand new example. You're the, I think, probably the first show I'm I'm getting to tell this on. I was doing a reading, I think it was about two weeks ago for this gentleman. And it was on the phone because a lot of the readings I do are on the phone because it's just as accurate as in person because, once again, moving at the speed of light, his father's spirit connected. And he said, well, I know who my father was, but I didn't know my father because he died when I was a baby. I said, two snakes, two snakes. He keeps telling me two snakes. And he goes, I don't know what that means. I said, well... When I think of two snakes, unless you guys, you know, had a couple snakes get in the house or something, I'm, I think of the medical symbol, you know, the staff with the snakes on. He goes, I'm familiar with that because I think it's Native American. I go, why? He said, well, my dad was Native American. He goes, well, and so am I. He said, but I don't know what that means. I said, all right, don't worry about it. Just jot it down. Let's move on to the next message. The next day, I received an email from he and his wife, and they took a picture and attached it to the email uh, from this book. Um, His father was of the Sioux Nation, Mm S-I-O-U-X. And Sioux means in the Sioux language, two snakes. Oh, wow. I didn't know this. Wow. He didn't know this. He found out. He found out afterwards. And so when people tell me you're cold reading, really, I fling out two snakes hoping to get a hit. I mean, I could say, like, oh, you had a puppy. All right, well, primarily everybody's had a puppy, but two snakes? Not really. Yeah. And 
other people claim, well, you're mind reading. Number one, how am I mind reading somebody over the phone? And, uh, you know, maybe I could electromagnetically, but I was reading something then that wasn't even in his mind. So how is that possible? And so, so that's because a spirit, his dad was letting him know that, yes, I'm, I'm your dad and that you are a proud member of the nation of the Sioux. Oh. And it was really amazing. And, and there was so much more to the message than that, because his father then proceeded to give him examples of what was happening in his life and also about some health, some hereditary health issues that he didn't know because his father had died um, when he was an infant. That's that is that is so amazing. And I think, you know, all the skeptics with this kind of story, they will think twice or they might just not because they're scared to go there. And uh, a big difference between me and my husband, he's extremely religious. So when I told him I'm going to speak to you, he, you know, he loves it, he's open to it. And I said, you know, and I'm going to speak to Mark to book a reading with him because I would like to talk to my mom. And I said, well, why don't you talk to your mom, too? Oh, no. Oh, no, I like to see her the way I do. I like to speak to her. I speak to her every day. But there was a total no blocking. And, and I, I'm just thinking that's fine and to be respected. But for me, um, I'm not scared. You know, I, I would like to hear, speak or whatever. And uh, it is very, very interesting to just see how, you know, the way you're brought up can really dogmatically say yes or no, even to the science of it, which I think is so interesting. And coming back to what you were saying about the vibrations on the spider web, you have a fantastic story together with your son where you went snorkeling. And yeah. then yeah, you tell us that story and then we get into the raft method, which I think is absolutely fantastic to just see the how between you know us non-mediums, how we can really pick up on these frequency beacons. But tell us first the story. And that really kind of, uh, I don't know, makes it a little bit more imaginable what's actually happening when it comes to the frequency. Yes. Um, when I was 13 years old, um, I, I grew up in Florida. Um, in fact, I still live, live uh, near the ocean. And my father had been a Navy SEAL, and he was a scuba diver. Oh, and you were the son. You're right. Sorry. I was the son. You were the son. <laughs> scuba diver. And I understand that uh, my dad at one point actually dove with the legendary Jacques Cousteau. Um, and this is before I was born. Uh, and my brother, my older brother said, I was a little kid, and dad brought me with him to this dive shop. And there was this guy that talked real weird. And then later on, I knew that uh, I, I heard that that was Jacques Cousteau. My brother was like six years old, and he met Jacques Cousteau, which Amazing. I thought was was, uh, what was a just, legend. So, um, but I love to to snorkel. And snorkeling is where you wear a mask and, you know, you wear the snorkel and fins. And uh, my parents surprised me. They said, we're going to the Bahamas for a week and uh, we're going to Love Beach, which is uh, off Nassau. Anyway, dad, um, you know, he was very adamant about when we're in the ocean, you stay with me. He said, and he, he, being a Navy SEAL, he taught my brother and I like how to walk through the woods without making noise, how to swim without splashing. He said, attracting attention in the ocean is not a good thing. Okay. And the, the thing about the Bahamas and the Caribbean, the water's crystal clear. And so we're, we're, we're um, snorkeling and I just got so caught up in how beautiful it was, the sea fans and, and all these uh, schools of like bright blue and, and bright yellow fish. And it was just, just incredible. And the problem is I, I wasn't paying attention and I got caught up in what I was doing and the ocean current pulled me away from the reef. And then I realized I was in really deep water and I was getting pulled out to sea and I started panicking. So I started mm -hmm. splashing and, and dad zipped up right you know, by me. And, and all of a sudden he stuck, he, he gave this uh, uh, hand signal meant, yeah. you know, get your head above water. And he goes, get in now. Don't turn back. Do exactly what I tell you. And I, I knew not to question and so uh, I start swimming and he goes quietly and as quick as you can now. And so I start swimming and I look back and then I see it. This huge shark was zipping through the water like a torpedo closing in on us. And my dad had seen it and he positioned himself between the shark and me. 
And if you want to find out what happens, you're going to have to read The Afterlife Frequency. Which is this fabulous book. I'm not going to give everything away. Let me just tell as much as that sharks, they don't see with their eyes, but they pick up with their nose on frequencies. They, they do. And um, studying the anatomy of a shark, they have these two long nerves that run down each side of their body. A shark is the ultimate sonar. They can pick up vibrations. And what happened was, because I was splashing, that was the same sound as a wounded fish. Mm -hmm. And they detect things like that. And, and so I learned a lot that day. Um, frequency and vibration is part of our very existence. Um, it's energy. I mean, it, it's at the end of the, it's electromagnetic energy. And uh, this, is, this is what it all boils down to at the end of the day, right? It, it does. And so I was trying to figure out, Patricia, how do I explain this to people who aren't mediums or psychics? You know, even though not everyone can do what I do, it's like not everybody can be an Olympic swimmer. Not everybody can be a mathematician like Elon Musk. Not everybody, you know, um, can be an incredible musician. You know, not everybody's an Elton John or a Rachmaninoff. Um, or Mark Anthony. Or... <laughs> Well, I appreciate you saying that. And, and, and so, but I had hit writer's block. Okay. And nothing was happening. And I, I know when you get writer's block, walk away from it. So I figure I'm going to walk, take a walk on the beach. So I'm heading down my driveway and I get these cold chills and tingles. Ah, so I know that that's just something, a spiritual contact, but it directed me away from the beach and down this bike path near my house. So I'm walking down the bike path and I see these two objects shining in the light. And I look over and it's a nickel and a penny. And I go to pick them up and I hear my mom's voice in spirit say, if it's heads down, it's bad luck. And I start laughing because the Italian side of my family has a superstition for all occasions. If the coins are down, you know, heads down, you know, don't walk under a ladder. God help you if you break a mirror. You know, so I'm laughing. And then I hear dad's voice. It's money. Grab it. <laughs> the scientist, the NASA scientist. Yeah, right. So Despite being a medium. <laughs> So, so I'm holding this nickel and penny in my hand. I go, oh, six cents. I go, oh, six cents. I go, okay, okay, okay. What do you tell me? What do you tell me? Because I knew, I knew this was something. And the cold chills and tingles are really happening. And then in my mind's eye, I saw my dad standing up to his waist in the ocean. And he was holding this blue canvas raft that he used to have. I go, raft, raft. And then it hit me. Mark. Teach people how to recognize signs from spirits. Accept the contact is real. Feel it without overthinking it and trust the message. I'm like, that's it. And so I ran back. Um, I, I flipped on my computer. I was like, come on, come on, boot up, boot up. Yeah, you know, yeah. Before it leaks out, you know, and, and, um, and the words just flew out of me. And that's what my parents were doing was explaining how everybody can benefit and detect signs from spirits. You don't have to be a medium or a psychic, but you still have the same pineal gland and solar plexus. We all have the same physiology and recognize the signs from spirits. And see, they did it by walking me through it. Maybe. I felt the cold chills and tingles, okay? I saw the coins, the sixth sense, accept it as real. Feel it without overthinking it. This is where people go wrong. Oh, this is just a coincidence. It's my imagination. That's where most people nix it right there. Then trust the message. Now, how do you know to trust a message from a spirit? I mean, we saw recently in the news a shaman who said that that motivated him to start an into or be part of an insurrection. We hear religious fanatics in parts of the world uh, persuade, you know, room temperature IQ people to put on bomb vests and blow up children. Yep. Are those messages from the divine? Are those messages from spirits? Absolutely not. Those are messages from the human ego edging God out by a narcissistic sociopath who is looking for moral justification for their ego-driven agenda. That has nothing to do with spirituality. It annoys me when the media refers to some terrorist spiritual advisor. No, he's a religious advisor. There's nothing spiritual about those people because spirits and the messages from the divine, from the divine power of God, never, never are about anger, 
bigotry, hatred, or violence. They're about peace, love, healing, resolution, protection. And therein lies the difference. So when, and, and, you know, and you look at it through the history of cults, the history of religious fanaticism, the history of, of violence and, and bigotry and hatred, and people are always seeking this, oh, God told me to do this. No, God didn't tell you to do this. Your ego did. Yeah. And Edging a, God out. I love that one. Very edging good. God out. That, that's the ego. Yeah. And think about it. Anytime you have done something hurtful to another person, hurt their feelings, were you acting out of love for them or were you acting out of a me, me, me? The latter. Of course, of course, which then translates into another uh, realm you talk about as well, which is karma. But I think what is very interesting in the raft method, you know, the recognize, accept, uh, um, R A uh, F. T. Exactly. T is that my own experience, I it's been years that I do transcendental meditation. So, and you do change brain waves as you were yes. explaining before. So uh often I try to get to Tether, of course. Um, and when I do it in the presence of my family, so for example, my husband would say to me, you know, I feel really, really tired. Why don't you do a little bit of TM? Yeah. And he would never, he's not spiritual in that sense, he would never learn something like meditation because this is what my job is in the family. But he thoroughly enjoys when I do my TM that I transmit certain energies that he's able to pick up on. And that is exactly the how of right. anybody being actually able to grab hold of that frequency the afterlife frequency, which actually is in parallel with us all the time. May the force be with you. All right. Exactly. And that, that's one of the proof that I have. It, it is. And you just gave a really good example of how your EMS overlaps with your husband's EMS. Okay. Because um, the, the frequency alignment, you know, that's how we're in tune with other people. It all gets back to where energetically linked. And you also gave a very good example of how the raft technique can be applied, not just to a situation like I was in, but to maybe you go to a medium, or maybe you have a, a TM experience like you and your husband did, or making sense of a near death experience or a deathbed vision. Um, so, so it became apparent to me that the raft technique can be used across the entire spectrum of the different forms of spiritual communication. And that's one of the reasons I wrote the afterlife frequency is because traditionally, Patricia, um, meditations in one field, spirit communications in another, near-death experiences in another, out-of-body experiences in another, they're not. Mm -hmm. They all have a common denominator of energy transfer and frequency alignment. And so that's why um, I decided or one of the many reasons I decided to write this book was to show that all these forms of spiritual contact are actually related and they're all based on sound scientific principles, which are based on quantum physics. I've had some people say, oh, well, you know, you're, you're shoving God to the side. It's like, absolutely not. As Nikola Tesla said, and I think you mentioned this in the beginning, mm -hmm. what one person calls God, another calls the laws of physics. God exists. The afterlife exists. Our EMS is an eternal living being. We can communicate with um, EMSs, our souls, and we'll be reunited with our loved ones in the light when it's our time to leave this world. And the thing is, God has a delivery system, and quantum physics explains that delivery system. And there's nothing blasphemous or heretical about that understanding. And, and I think it's exciting that we live in an era now where we're developing the technology to completely bridge the gap between faith and science. Absolutely. And this is also what you name from science fiction to science fact, because anybody that says, no, it's not being proven by science and science is a fact is totally I don't know on what planet because science is a moving target it's involvement you know with every day you discover something new you add on the science which of course is something that is established but continuously growing evolving and once one has that concept that everything kind of within its realm stays the same yet shifts all right 
one can be open to these kind of things. And I think it is, it is a really, one of the first thoughts I had when I read your book was, you know what, it's actually not worth mourning death. It's worth mourning life. Because yeah. often <laughs> a lot of people had really bad lives and now they're good. All right. And then hopefully, I mean, I'm, you know, I study Kabbalah and we do believe in reincarnation and depending on how many tikkuns you have actually overcome and lessons learned in your life, you may, you may not reincarnate at a higher or lower level of physical existence, but that's another thing. Now we have to wrap up our conversation. As I said, I have a million questions. I couldn't even pause half of them is, you know, what is the advice you would give somebody that goes, all right, let me do a reading. I'm curious with what sort of mindset and expectations there would come to you, somebody like you that is able to interpret frequency with words. It's important in, in the chapter in the book called avoiding the no, no, no syndrome and the unfolding, because a lot of people come in and information will get presented to me and I'll transmit it to them. No, no, no. And they start shooting everything down. And the no, no, no creates an energetic barrier and the spirits will start to back off. Also, it's okay to maybe have a couple of questions, but don't come in with a set agenda. Like, until I hear this, I don't believe this. I had somebody come in and she wanted to talk to her son, and I got like 50 pieces of evidence, his name, how he died. I mean, all this verified. But I needed to hear this one thing. Well, I want, I want, I want energetically is the same as no, no, no. So she was blocking, and she was so focused on she needed to hear something about, you know, a feather or whatever it was. Um, the fact that I gave um, you know, his name, how he died, where they lived, and him telling her what she had been doing the day before. I mean, um, all of those like 50 pieces of evidence. So check your expectations at the door. Come with a positive mindset. And it's normal to be nervous or excited. All that yeah. means is your energy is up. Don't be afraid. The boogeyman's not going to come and get you. This is a conversation with people you love who love you. Okay, and they're they're as excited to make the direct contact as you are. So I, I think you know, come with an open mind. You know, I had somebody say, I, I I can't do a reading. I'm too scared. Well, then don't do it. Um, if if you're if you're gonna be be so obsessed with fear, then then mm. you shouldn't do it. You'll know when you're ready. You'll yeah. know. When now, I mean, when you're, when you're afraid, your chemistry changes anyway, and a lot of things in, in your body are blocked. And I wonder whether these kind of fears may also come or the curiosity to, to speak to the soul in the case of suicide. Because I think a lot of people are really at, you know, when, you know, my mom, she was sick. It was looking as if she was leaving us. She did. But out of the blue, I have friends that lost friends out of the blue. And they said, oh, my God, I should have known. I should have felt. I should have seen. And I'm sure they would love to just say, hey, what happened? What did we miss? Why did you have to kill yourself? Was was your mom having a lot of problem uh, along her spinal column, like stiffness and pain? Yeah. Like in your head? Absolutely. Okay, all right. I'm sorry. She's coming through. <laughs> okay. Oh, my God. No, no. <laughs> I knew you had a question, but she said, no, this is my time. Okay. So she's coming through, and she was having a very difficult time articulating prior to passing like she was trying to talk it's like <gasps> and um my pancreas is hurting really really badly did she have any issues with her pancreas or blood sugar levels do you know she was um towards the end was basically everything all of her organs failed her and she yeah. could not talk yeah, my pancreas, it feels like if you could take like a, a, a screwdriver and stick yeah. it right in there, she's having a lot of pain there. And um, yeah, her, her her bowels, her lower GI tract. I mean, yeah, she she was in excruciating pain. And there's two things. She said that you already know this. She said how much I love you. And she goes, you also know how proud I am of you, but I just want to make sure that you know and she also said that you were so wonderful when she was passing because you weren't egging her on to live 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 survive survive you were comforting her in the transition because she said that's what i needed she said i needed to get to the point where i was ready to let go and you helped me do that because nothing was going to change the inevitability of this outcome and she shows me a white dove and two two parakeets is there anything about parakeets birds with blue chests 
uh, somewhere in your background or her background? That I don't know. But what you say in terms of me helping her, comforting her is super true because I was the first one that is open to, I help you to facilitate your wish. And I always felt she was so in pain and she would never accept. I mean, she got uh, acute leukemia. Then she was given chemo. And the chemo basically resulted in a collateral um, impact of being paralyzed from the neck down. So my mom could not, and she is, she's a mover. My mom is a mover, obese as she was. And I always said, mom, you know, I know this is difficult for you. You, I know you don't want to live like this, but if, you know, you ask me anything, I'll, I'll be there for you. And nobody would do it. She keeps getting back to these blue birds. She said the song of birds, the okay. song of birds. So I want you to think about this is one of those things that will make sense later on. Yeah. But the white dove, um, that to me, symbolize, unless there's an, uh, something with a white dove, that symbolizes ascension to the white light. OK, so she wants you to know that she's in the white light. But this beautiful blue, it, it's funny because even though I'm seeing on, you know how some parakeets are green and others are blue, they have this this light Powder. I call this Virgin Mary blue. OK, so it could be some reference to the month of May. OK, because May is dedicated to Mary, the mother of Jesus. Also a name like Mary, Maria, Marilyn, something like that. Well, she is born in May. She was and there we go. OK, <laughs> we go. she was born in May. OK, so that's what that is. But you know what? I get the feeling that there's going to be something with um, a bird, some um, maybe it could be a could be a parakeet, but it could be a bluebird or a blue jay of some sort. Mm-hmm. That the song of birds is going to bring you peace. And, and it may be something where you're going to be somewhere and you hear this and it's 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 going to be like a sign. It's not going to be like it's going to be a sign from her. OK, so she gave us May. She told us that she ascended. She validated what was going on with her physically. And also, thank you for you facilitating and helping her in that transition. Okay. Wonderful. And she said, I'm sorry about all the paperwork. <laughs> oh, my God. Thanks that you told me that one. Oh, my God. Okay, mommy. All right. You saw what was going on. Unbelievable. That is something that I'm going to tell you when we're not recording anymore. Okay. Some <laughs> madness happening here. That's for sure. <laughs> Don't apologize, mom. It's okay. I handled it and I'm still handling <laughs> and you're more than worth it. <laughs> wow. Oh, wow. Thank you. That was uh, unexpected. So um, to all. I, you know, I, I, it's funny because spirits are going to get a message through one way or the, another. And, you know, I, I wasn't planning on on doing a reading, but what you planned and what I planned and what she wanted to accomplish. And normally, and I want to say this for the benefit of the readers, um, we see these TV shows where mediums run into a pizza parlor and say, hi, I'm a medium, blah, 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 you know, and it's very scripted because there's eight different camera angles, perfect makeup, perfect lighting, perfect sound. You know, there's a whole camera crew there. So there's nothing spontaneous or, or real about that. I'm not saying that these mediums don't have ability, but please take this for what it is. Mm-hmm. Also, it's unethical to run in and just force a reading on somebody. That's like going in, you know, running in and go, hi, I'm a dentist. I think you need a, a root canal and hold them down and like start pulling teeth out, okay? Because that person's there to eat pizza. What made this different is that Patricia understands the process and she was open to the contact. Her mother came forward. I could have you know, said, well, this isn't the appropriate time, but your mother apparently was a very insistent person and was not going to take no nine <laughs> for, an for an answer. answer. <laughs> okay. And so that's why I chose or rather was guided to deliver this message because I see a lot of inexperienced mediums run around and just start flinging readings at people. Mm-hmm. Are you doing this because that person really needs this? Or are you saying, I'm showing off my superpower, okay? Because this is not a superpower. This is a gift, a service gift, which is to be used to help people understand that our loved ones didn't disintegrate. They've simply transferred to the afterlife frequency. Amazing. I cannot add anything to that. Just thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being you. 
coming through, you know, the, the bodies of your parents creating you as a, as a double medium. The afterlife frequency, for me, it really um, changed a lot about not only about what I think death is because it doesn't exist anymore for me, <laughs> all right, but more importantly, how one looks at life, uh, any kind of life situation, and that at the end of the day, one can pick up but also influence energies. And that is what, what I think makes the entire thing so worthwhile. So thank you so much, Mark, um, for writing this, for doing your work, and, uh, well, <laughs> and for the reading, unexpected as it is. Thanks, thanks for saying hi to my mom and communicating her message. Fantastic. God bless. Thank you. And thank you, my dear Mentory TV community. Well, that was exceptional unique, unexpectedly beautiful. And uh, well, I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. The conversation with Mark Anthony JD, get this book. And also he's written a couple of other books. Uh, look him up if you can face a reading. Um, you know, he is there for you. And um, yeah, just look at things the way they are. And it's all about energy. It's everywhere. And just like George Lucas says, May the force be with you. See you soon. Bye.